All right. Well, good morning, everyone. I'd first like to thank Janssen Pharmaceuticals for sponsoring uh, this talk uh, this morning and all their support of the foundation. So a couple years ago, I was here talking about microvascular obstruction, which is, uh, I guess, an obs become an obsession of mine. Um, and I wanted to kind of highlight some new research. A lot of it's been done like by our summer interns here as part of the uh, summer research uh, program. So to sort of highlight their work and some new insights that have occurred uh, with um, in the role of myocardial edema that it develops as a consequence of ischemia reperfusion injury. And these are my uh, disclosures. So this cartoon here sort of uh, highlights uh, some of the issues going on with the microvasculature both before, during, and after. And we're gonna what we're gonna pay attention to are these two down here, myocardial edema and hemorrhage, which are consequences of uh, reperfusion. You know, we've spent a lot of time and energy getting patients in so we can open up their occluded artery when they're having an ST elevation myocardial infarction. Um, and we've made great progress in that, but there's a consequence for opening an occluded artery that we're gonna talk about. Uh, and that's called lethal reperfusion injury. And um, that may contribute up to 40% of the final uh, infarct size. So obviously we wanna open the artery up because if you don't open an artery up in absence of reperfusion, then your infarct size is gonna be 70% of your area at risk. But if you have reperfusion, uh, you can reduce that significantly. But if you had mild reperfusion when with some form of cardioprotection, then you can s reduce this another 25% or so. So there is a, obviously we open the artery, but we're still left with a lot of, um, of uh, residual injury uh, from the from the reperfusion. So if everyone turns their head sideways, just, this is a, we'll start with a, a case. This is an 89 year old female who had 20 hours of shortness of breath and chest pain, and you can see that she has some uh, inferior uh, ST segment uh, elevation consistent with the myocardial uh, infarction, and she was emergently taken to the cath lab as part of our level one protocol. And here's her. Uh, occluded right coronary artery on the, um, on the left, and I don't know if I can get this, yeah, there we go. So you can just see we open the artery up and put in a stent, but you can see how slow the flow is down the artery. In fact, the, the dye doesn't even reach the distal vasculature. So this is sort of pathognomonic for uh, microvascular uh, obstruction. And we still don't know, uh, it's still a conundrum, we don't know why people some do and some don't. We could have the identical person in the room next door having her right coronary artery open up and she'll have brisk TIMI3 flow and no evidence of microvascular obstruction. So there's a lot of enigmas about uh, MBO. We know that it's quite common. We see it in seven, 40 to 70% of all our STEMI patients have MBO when we get a cardiac MRI on them. And it can be manifested as clinically as persistent ST elevation on the EKG, which I'll show you or what's also called no reflow, which was just shown in that uh, video. And there's multiple factors that contribute to MBO. Uh, in part is distal atheroembolic debris, platelet and white blood cell clumping. And this is classically seen when we open up uh, an old vein graft that you can immediately get a cessation of flow uh, because all that debris goes downstream and lodges in the microvasculature. And uh, subsequently, they've developed these filter devices that will actually catch all that debris going downstream that you can then retrieve and preserve flow. But I don't think this is the main uh, culprit for MBO that we see uh, in, um, in STEMI. And that's more likely going to be due to microvascular uh, uh, dysfunction, secondary to ischemia, reperfusion injury. And a big part of that that I hope to show you is that the, the edema causes extrinsic compression of the microvasculature. And there's also destruction of the vascular integrity, which leads to intramyocardial hemorrhage. Uh, and so this MVO and IMH are two, the two most, uh, the worst things you could have uh, associated with your MI because they have very dire consequences for your long-term uh, recovery of left ventricular function. And this is just, uh, this is someone who underwent uh, successful PCI of their LAD, and you can see here the persistent ST elevation still on their uh, EKG here, uh, consistent uh, with the no reflow uh, uh, phenomena. 
But the best way to, to identify MVO um, is, is by cardiac MRI. And you can see here on the left, this just shows this, uh, this uh, hypo-intense region here, this black area here, which is the area of infarct. And within the core of the infarct, there's going to be this hyper-enhanced, um, hypo-enhanced orange area. And this is the microvascular obstruction. So this is where the contrast cannot get into the myocardium uh, due to either extrinsic compression or internal obstruction of the microvasculature. So this is uh, someone who had a big anterior MI. So, so there are definitely consequences to having microvascular obstruction. So this is a study of uh, a few years ago of 1,000 STEMI patients who received primary uh, PCI. And they just compared the, those patients that had MVO versus those that didn't have uh, MVO. And you can see here on this curve that if you did not have MVO, that your event-free survival was really pretty good. And this is out to over two years. However, if you did have microvascular obstruction, then you had a significant reduction in your event-free uh, uh, survival. And what they determined is that actually MVO is a more powerful predictor of event-free survival than was infarct size, which we traditionally think is always being, uh, you know, a very powerful uh, predictor. And it, and it is, not to diminish infarct size, it is very powerful. But actually MVO in this study was actually more powerful than uh, infarct size. So then the next question is, well, does the amount of MVO that you have, does that matter? And yes, indeed it does. So this pooled seven randomized primary uh, PCI trials that, had car that were cardiac MRI based uh, and had all the patients had an MRI within seven days of their PCI. And overall, they found that 57% of all STEMI patients had MVO. And you can see when you broke down the MVO by tertiles between 2.3%, 4%, and 7% uh, of LV mass of the infarct size, you can see that there was a clear uh, worsening in all-cause mortality and heart failure hospitalization uh, in the, in, uh, that worsened with the degree of um, MVO. So not only does having MVO bad, but the more MVO you have, it seems like the worse outcome you will have. So what about, what's the long-term cardiac MRI data show of patients with MVO following STEMI? So we actually have some great data here at our foundation from the time trial that we were charter members of, um, which was a consortium of seven uh, clinical uh, sites in the U.S. that did stem cell studies. Our first two studies were time and late time, uh, looking at the effects of uh, delivery of bone marrow mononuclear stem cells following anterior myocardial uh, uh, infarction. And, and we, uh, because this is a well-funded study, we we're actually able to do MRIs on these patients at six months, one year, and at two years. So we could kind of track how they, they did. And this just shows the change in ejection fraction over two years. And what we found was that, that the uh, bone marrow mononuclear cells did not really improve left ventricular function even when followed out to, to, to two years. So there was no Unfortunately, no benefit. I mean, we've subsequently, this has been replicated in many other studies from here and in Europe, that the bone marrow mononuclear cells just aren't a very robust uh, cell type for improving uh, LV function over time in people with anterior MIs. So basically, all these studies, the, whether they got BMCs or placebo is irrespective. So we did an analysis where, well, what, let's look at what's the effect of MVO just in those, those 120 uh, patients. So you can see here that 47 uh, had MBO and 60 uh, did not. And you can see they had similar age, so age wasn't a discriminating factor. But look at, look at sex. That only um, one out of 15 um, of the females had MBO, whereas 14 of the 15 females did not. So that seems, that's an interesting finding that, that uh, the presence of MBO may you know, have a sex-based effect. But look at the differences uh, in patients with MVO. They had much higher um, infarct size, even by M measured by MRI and by, car by CK, you know, almost a 50% increase in CK. Their EFs were significantly lower, and their LV volumes, end diastolic and end systolic volumes, were significantly higher if you had MVO. So again, just in this, this study that wasn't looking at MVO, when you go back and 
compare MBO versus no MBO. Again, this just highlights how bad it is to have uh, MBO. And then when you compare at six months, the changes, I showed you the baseline numbers. Now here are the changes at six months, and you can see for left ventricular end diastolic volume that there are significant increases in uh, systolic and end diastolic volumes in people that had MVO compared to those patients that did not have MVO where they had minimal remodeling. And furthermore, when you looked at the change in ejection fraction over six months, if you had MVO, you had absolutely no recovery of your left ventricular function. Whereas if you did have, uh, if, you're, if you had no MVO, then you had a, a very respectable 6% increase in your ejection fraction at uh, six months. <clears throat> now we took this analysis farther and just published this. This was from, this is a first of many students who were here, Sarah Davidson, who uh, went to, was at University of Miami for um, undergrad when she worked with us. Then she went to Duke University Med School, and now she's at the University of uh, Minnesota doing a residency in OBGYN. So she sort of strayed off the cardiac path. So I guess part of that's my fault. But, <laughs> but, um, but she just published this paper. So we took our data of the patients at MVO, and we pooled it with the Swiss AMI study and with, uh, and with uh, a study from France. And what we found was that when you, so we found all three of those studies found no benefit of giving bone marrow mononuclear stem cells to patients following MI. However, if you break down and just looked at those patients that had microvascular obstruction, we actually found that the bone marrow cells had a, caused a significant improvement in left ventricular function and less adverse remodeling compared to those patients without MVO who received placebo. So to our knowledge, this is actually the first uh, real study that has showed a therapeutic option uh, for patients with microvascular obstruction following uh, STEMI. <clears throat> so let's look at a little bit of the historical perspectives of MVO, or it was originally called no reflow. And it was first identified in the brain probably 40 years ago that uh, greater than a two, point, two and a half minute occlusion of a cerebral vessel resulted in impaired blood flow with restoration of the, uh, of the occlusion. And this was looked at in the heart by Rob Cloner, who did a lot of the early seminal work. Um, and his first paper was called The No Reflow Phenomena After Temporary Coronary Occlusion in the Dog. And what they observed was that if you tied the artery, LED coronary artery up for 40 minutes and then opened the artery again, everything was fine. But if you extended it out to 90 minutes, you only had partial restoration of, of blood flow, despite the artery being wide open. So this was a real uh, conundrum. Why, you know, the, the arteries open. And this began the shift from the epicardial vessel to the microvasculature, where, you know, where we are now. And they did a lot of uh, electron microscopy and other hist histologic studies. And what they found was that in these people that had 90 minutes of ischemia, or the dogs, I should say, they had significant capillary damage, endothelial cell swelling and protrusions. Occasionally, they found fibrin and platelet thrombi, and there's prominent interstitial and myocardial edema compressing the capillaries. So again, this, will, this will, was the first insight that uh, describing the importance of myocardial edema, edema and manifesting microvascular obstruction. And they also noted that it was more pronounced in the subendocardium that it increased with ischemic duration, and it's a process rather than an immediate event like you see in a distal embolization in a bypass graft uh, PCI, and that overall the no reflow area increases over uh, time. So that suggests that maybe since it does keep increasing over time, that maybe there's, it gives us some opportunity to get in there and, and do some kind of therapy maybe to blunt that. So what I want to talk about now, so this whole thing of this whole injury is called ischemia reperfusion injury. Um, and that's really the nexus between myocardial edema and microvascular obstruction. And unfortunately, uh, we've given uh, hundreds of drugs to animals to be able to reduce ischemia reperfusion injury. But unfortunately, every, almost every one of those studies has been negative in man. So uh, these, these may work in animals. Uh, but in, in man, it's been a real issue trying to find some therapies uh, for ischemia reperfusion injury. So a little bit of a background on myocardial edema. So first of all, you, when you think about your heart, it's actually a big bag of water. It's like 
79 grams per 100 gram of the cardiac tissue is actually water. Um, and water moves across cell membranes, passive, determined by osmotic gradients and membrane permeability. But following reperfusion, the intravascular space is suddenly occupied by blood with a physiologic osmolarity and tonicity in normal uh, protein and ion concentrations. But then there's this osmotic gradient that develops between the intervascular and the interstitial space, and water begins to move from the vascular space into the interstitium. And you compound that by having endothelial damage so that you're you, know, you have a barrier there that breaks down, and then you get protein leakage into that space that enhances the interstitial edema. And it's very hard right now to... Um, so there's both intracellular and interstitial edema. And determining um, those two, I think, is still an unmet uh, challenge. I'm not aware of any uh, MRI applications to differentiate water distribution in the heart. Maybe Joao later on can tell us if that's, if that's changing. But it still, I think, represents a big problem is determining the compartmentalization of this water because both contribute to uh, the microvascular obstruction. So this, this is, again, there's some old studies I'm showing you because a lot of this is sort of being re rediscovered. But the development of this myocardial edema is it dependent on reperfusion. So uh, this group from Spain, they've been very prominent. This guy, Garcia Dorado and, you know, Fuster from, eight, they all, the, Spain, the Spaniards have a very long and uh, great interest in myocardial infarction and reperfusion injury. And uh, so this... Gentleman here subjected 21 pigs to LAD occlusion, and they either reperfused them after 48 minutes, 78 minutes, or they had no reperfusion at all. And this histology here over on the left, this is what happened when there's no reperfusion, that there's very little wa additional water. But as you increase your ischemia and then reperfusion, you can see the increasing amounts of uh, interstitial uh, edema there. <clears throat> and they actually measured the water, so they didn't even just looked at, they actually, you can take the, the, the heart out and desiccate it and see how much water is actually there. And you can see that in the non-reperfused heart, per 100 gram of tissue, it went from 42, 427 up to 510 and 533. Uh, and in some of these animals, they actually did an infusion to wash out a lot of the, those uh, metabolites to see if that would have an effect. Um, and it really didn't have much of an effect. But what did have the effect was that if you did have reperfusion, that you got a significant amount of uh, interstitial edema. And then they took the hearts out, and they actually did MRIs on them. This is one of the first studies to show that T2 uh, imaging by cardiac MRI is actually a really good way to follow this edema. And you can see that the, um, the increase in the T2 signal intensity goes from 339 up to, you know, 480, 490 with reperfusion. So this study, I think, was important on several accounts and actually heralded the way, was one of the original studies to show that <clears throat> MRI would be a really good way to uh, follow the uh, uh, edema. And this when, what about live instead of with pathology? So this, this was a, uh, a study of, um, in dogs that, that went acute ischemia, then reperfusion, and they actually performed echocardiographic analysis. And you can see in uh, the ischemic zone versus the remote zone, that you can see that the end diastolic wall thickness significantly increased in the ischemic zone as a result of the myocardial edema. So from 10,000 feet, you say, oh, uh, this is LVH. So is LVH bad? And it is bad. But it's not for the reasons that we thought. I think we, we always were taught that left ventricular hypertrophy and it is bad because it does impair subendocardial uh, uh, perfusion. But a lot of the LVH that you see on an echo after, you know, after STEMI is actually due to the uh, edema. And these are just a couple papers that, that I just recently came across. Influence of left ventricular hypertrophy on infarct size and ejection fraction. Well, we, you know, so this is going to be, I'll show you in shortly that this is all associated with MVO. So I think what they're really seeing, what they didn't really comment on the time, is they're seeing the consequences of MVO. Another paper, impact of left ventricular hypertrophy on myocardial injury. So I think, you know, it's a chicken and the egg thing that the uh, edema ends up causing, or makes the ventricle look thick, 
It's called LVH, but in fact, it's actually uh, due to myocardial uh, edema. So this was a very nice uh, study, you know, 10 years ago that actually followed serial MRIs in pigs that underwent 90 minutes coronary occlusion followed by reperfusion. And so here they use T2 imaging to, uh, to look at myocardial edema in the infarct zone and remote. So you can see that the remote zone had very little uh, edema or a T2 signal, but it significantly increased, the edema significantly increased over time and stayed there for quite a while and then it starts to go down. Here's the scar size. The infarct size is quite high initially and then over time that infarct size goes down. Now part of the infarct size measurement is actually edema. And so that leads to, uh, that leads to a decrease in uh, relative infarct size uh, over time. Over here is T2 star imaging, which we'll talk about. It's a good way to look for myocardial hemorrhage. And you can see what happens to this signal over the first couple days in the infarct zone in this T2 star. And then here in this quadrant over here is uh, microvascular obstruction. And you can see that this MVO is high at first, but that it gradually resolves over time. And our data will bear that out too. So they concluded that the um, MRI relaxation times T1, T2, and T2 star are affected in different ways with respect to their sensitivity to the presence of edema or hemorrhage within the tissue matrix. T2 appears to be a, a reliable indicator of inflammation post-AMI. However, edema and hemorrhage have counteracting effects on T2, and so care should be taken when evaluating at T2. There's a lot going on on day two, um, and we'll talk about for a second. And then at day two, edema-related T2 elevations in the infarct zone are blunted by hemorrhagic byproducts that, that are identified on the T2 star signal voids. By week two, T2 star reduction in the infarct zone was associated with hemorrhage as well as mineralization. So there was a big debate that came out a few years ago between the Spanish group of what Garcia Dorado was one and the Scottish group like with Colin Barry who was here last year who gave a talk. And um, the Spanish group proposed, they did some uh, serial MRIs and they found that myocardial edema had a bimodal distribution that actually went down. It increased and after a few days then it went down and then it came back up again. But the Scottish group, Colin Barry and that group said, ah, not so fast. What you're seeing here is actually the degradation uh, of your T2, star, T2 signal by the uh, red blood cell products. So if you look here in these two, these are in humans. If you look between those humans that have myocardial hemorrhage, which is a downstream complication of MBO, and you don't, you can see this decrease in the T2 uh, like at day three. Whereas if you don't have hemorrhage, there's no decrease. So they would argue that this bimodal distribution of edema is actually just a, an artifact from your, your T2 uh, measurements due to the presence of uh, myocardial uh, hemorrhage. And over here you can see in patients, again, that the edema stays up, but then it will gradually uh, resolve over time. And indeed, this is our data from the time study where I said we had serial two-year data. And you can see here that there's a 30 to 40% reduction in infarct size out to two years. And then when you measure LV mass, which we'll get back to in a second, you can see there's a significant reduction in LV mass, irrespective of if you've got BMCs or placebo, but you can see around a 30% reduction in LV mass. So we, we believe that a lot of the reduction in infarct size is, goes hand in hand with the reduction in LV mass. And I hope to show you then that actually it's due to the resolution of, of myocardial edema. So this is uh, a paper that was published late last year in American Journal of Physiology by Nicole Bonfig, who's another one of our summer students, and she and Chase um, are at med school at, at the University of Minnesota. I think they're starting their third year now. And Ananya Shaw, who was also in our program, Sarah Davidson. It's just uh, a plethora of uh, summer uh, students uh, just I guess just supports what a great job they do and how talented they are. But so this study we want to look at that we hypothesize that the increased extravascular compressive forces in the myocardium that arise from the development of edema due to ischemia root perfusion injury would contribute to the development of microvascular obstruction. 
So what we did is we measured MVO infarct size at LV mass in 385 STEMI patients using cardiac MRI two to three days following PCI. And overall, we found that MVO was present in 57% of patients. So again, another study, somewhere between 40 and 60% of, uh, of moderate size to large infarcts have uh, MVO. So why, what, what is, what's about this uh, extravascular compressive forces? So this actually may be an important component to contributing to MVO. So first of all, the coronary vasculature is embedded in the myocardium, and it results in compression in systole, and as a result, most of it, which is, you know, we all know that most of coronary perfusion occurs in diastole when the heart re relax. But even in diastole, there's compression of the microvasculature that's determined by left ventricular and diastolic uh, pressure, and that this results in increased wall stress, and it's associated with increased myocardial mass, which could be ascribed as being left ventricular hypertrophy. So first of all, so in these 380 patients, what did we find? So first of all, we found, again, that if in those patients that had MVO, they had significantly greater infarct size than those patients who didn't have MVO. And we also, again, showed a nice relationship that just like I showed you in that earlier figure, that increasing MVO mass goes hand in hand with uh, infarct size. So I think we see this in general. That's a good rule of thumb. The bigger the infarct that you have, the more likely it is you're going to have more um, MVO. So the patients with MVO had significantly greater infarct size and reduced LV function compared to patients without MVO, and that MVO mass increases linearly with infarct size. So this plot here shows MVO mass versus LV mass, and you can see there's a nice linear increase um, between MVO and LV mass. So we think that part of the in acute increase in LV mass after uh, STEMI is due to uh, MVO, and if you look over here, that M the source of that MVO, or uh, what's associated with it, is increasing myocardial edemia. So those patients that have MVO have significantly greater levels of myocardial edemia than those patients without MVO. And then finally, when you actually measure myocardial edema with T2 imaging in those patients that had that, you can see again that there's a nice linear increase in myocardial edema in LV mass. So we think that the acute increase in LV mass is again a result of uh, myocardial edema. And we also measured then, we talked about the extravascular compressive forces, we also found that MVO was associated with higher left ventricular end diastolic pressures than if you didn't have uh, MVO. And why is that important? Again, what we talked about. So this is studies we did a long time ago in the, in the dog measurement of uh, the zero flow pressure. So how do you do this? So you, we have a dog, these dogs that are chronically instrumented, they have a flow probe on their LAD artery, and then they also have an adjustable occluder, and then they have a little catheter embedded in the artery to measure the pressure. So what you do is you maximally dilate the heart to get rid of resistance with adenosine, like when we're doing like a flow, flow reserve measurement. And then you gradually tighten up the occluder over the vessel. So what you're doing is you're gradually reducing perfusion, and you can measure that on the flow on your, on your flow probe. And eventually your, your flow stops at zero. But it doesn't stop when it's 100% occluded. It stops way short of that. And, at the, and it stops at, at a measurement of distal coronary pressure that's elevated. And this is a reflection of these, um, uh, these, end, these um, end diastolic pressure and the extravascular compressive forces. So you can see these are two sets of dogs, normal and dogs with heart failure. And you can see if you have heart failure that you're, you'll have a naturally greater end diastolic pressure that your zero flow occurs at around 25 millimeters of mercury, which happened to correlate exactly with the end diastolic pressure, whereas in normal dogs, the EDP was around 10 to 12. But you can see then how the end diastolic pressure could contribute to the no reflow uh, in the um, myocardium uh, following reperfusion. So again, I, we talked about the conundrum of MVO. So why doesn't everyone get MVO following STEMI? So we know that on average, as I mentioned before, 40 to 60 percent of STEMI patients get MVO. We know that MVO tends to increase with infarct size and ischemic duration, but it's not absolute. But in general, it's sort of like coronary calcification. It's sort of there's a nice linear relationship. 
but people are individuals and they're people that have high calcium scores and have no plaque and, and vice versa. And we also noted from our time trial that maybe females have less MVO than men. So this is some area that ha needs to, should be explored further. I think there are some studies that suggest that females have less ischemia reperfusion injury than males. And then there are these other unknown factors. So one thing we've always been interested in is the circadian basis for onset of myocardial infarction, tolerance to ischemia, and could there be a circadian basis for microvascular obstruction? So um, I don't know what happened to this slide here, but uh, got a, they got obliterated. But so anyway, so this first slide would show that, uh, you know, 40 years ago it was demonstrated that there are more myocardial infarctions in the morning. And there's actually more strokes in the morning. So something's going on in the morning that causes uh, people to have more heart attacks and strokes. And what you can, what... <laughs> This, what there were figures in this slide that showed that actually your, uh, your susceptibility to blood clotting actually increases at that time. So platelet aggregation ability increases in the morning. Your, res your response to your norepinephrine levels, your hormonal levels increase in the morning. So all those things conspire to make you more susceptible to forming a blood clot and having an MI or a stroke. So that was well, well known in, in all the data, you know, repeatedly bears that uh, out. So about 10 years ago, someone also showed, well, what about ischemic tolerance? Is there, is there uh, a circadian basis to ischemia tolerance? And uh, this group down in Alabama at UAB showed that in the mouse, depending on when you occluded the vessel, it determined how big an infarct size. So they demonstrated there was a circadian basis to ischemia uh, tolerance. So what we did is we actually looked at that in our, uh, in our patients here. And this was done by Ron Ryder, one of our fellows from about 10 years ago. And we actually observed that there is a, for a given ischemic duration, myocardial injury was greatest with coronary occlusion onset around 1 a.m. or reperfusion around uh, 4 a.m. And you can see here um, that there's, it's a little messy, but actually statistically it borne out that around midnight, 1 a.m., there was a greater increase in the, using peak CK as an infarct size normalized to area at risk by MRI, or just in all the patients, because not everyone had an MRI in this study, you can see that the peak CK uh, peaked around uh, 1 a.m. And this was subsequently uh, seen in several other uh, studies uh, from Europe that confirmed uh, those uh, findings. Um, so we wanted to look at, could MVO have a circadian basis? So uh, Nicole uh, did this uh, study along with Chase, Ananya, and Sarah, looking at um, time of day of myocardial infarction in the presence or absence of MVO. So first of all, this just shows the infarct size at the difference. So we divided the patients into eight three-hour intervals from midnight to 9 a.m., 3 o'clock, all the way to, to midnight. And so first of all, what you see in this graph is that the, compared to MVO versus no MVO, again, you can see the powerful effects that MVO had on infarct size. At every time period, if you had NVO, you had greater uh, infarct size. But overall, there wasn't, there wasn't a, a circadian basis for infarct size, except again, in the morning, you know, they tended to have bigger infarcts, which, which this supports what we found in the earlier studies that you may that the, that time point around 1 a.m., which is here, may have greater infarcts, and indeed we saw that again here. But this, is, this uh, so to look at that, we compared all the patients in the bins. They were in either 24 one-hour bins or eight three-hour bins, and we took all the patients in each, each time interval, and we did compared the ratio between those patients that had an MBO and those patients that didn't have MBO. And you can see here, right around 8 a.m., there is a ratio of, of 26 to 1 of MVO to no MVO at this time point. And, and even when you break it down by two and three hours, there's a statistically significantly more amount of MVO seen at these early morning hours. So this suggests that there, there may be an, a circadian basis to development of microvascular uh, obstruction. And it would make sense because we've, you know, people have already shown that you're your susceptibility to clotting goes up early in the, in the morning. So maybe your susceptibility to development of edema and ischemia reperfusion injury would also go up in the morning.
Now I want to conclude with a few um, kind of recent out of this world revelations about infarct size following uh, STEMI. And this is a picture from James Webb uh, Telescope, which continues to amaze uh, all of us here. So let's, the prevailing dogma, I think we were all taught this in med school or nursing school that uh, the infarct is largely completed after six hours of ischemia. So all these trials of ischemia reperfusion injury, like we're doing like with Faraday now, they can't have more than six hours of uh, ischemic duration because they say, oh, there's no chance of myocardial salvage after six hours. So why would you, why would you study that? So this is a, a study done years ago looking at the de delivery of supersaturated oxygen uh, after a, a myocardial infarction. So we've started using this uh, therapy a year ago now. We've done, I think Nick did one yesterday. So we've done 12 patients in the last year. And we're looking at late presenters, the very high risk patients that have had ischemic times out more than six hours. SSO2 is currently approved in the US and Europe for people that have had anterior infarctions, but less than six hours. But we wanted to see what, what can we do for these people that had late uh, presentations. So this was, I thought, a fascinating study in the pig. He took 12 pigs, tied off the uh, artery for an hour to create an infarct, and then released the uh, occlusion. And then 24 hours later, he came back to the pigs. Half the pigs, he just, they just observed, and the other half the pigs, they delivered supersaturated oxygen. So there's this uh, catheter, then you infuse down the artery of you know, they have partial pressures of like 900 millimeters of mercury of oxygen. So this is super saturated oxygen in the blood, and it just circulates throughout. And what they found was, I thought this was just remarkable, that even doing this 24 hours later, that they found that the uh, area of necrosis was reduced in half compared to those that just didn't have uh, super saturated oxygen. And over here, you can see what happens to your ejection fraction. Following 60-minute occlusion, it goes way down. 30 minutes of reperfusion, 24 hours, there's a little bit of recovery. And then the, the, the control group, they were done. They had no further recovery, but the, the SSO2 group had significant recovery uh, following uh, their, this uh, delivery of oxygen. So this, to me, suggests that, you know, six hours, that, that should get thrown out the window, that we can still influence infarct size uh, out to even a day or, or longer. And this was... Um, I think a recent editorial saying that we need to do something for these late presenters with myocardial infarction that, you know, and they, they highlighted all this uh, data. But if you're a late presenter, you're at really higher risk of cardiac complications, heart failure, and shock. And when this was really borne out in the COVID era when all these patients showed up late because they were afraid, everyone was afraid to go in the hospital. And all those patients that showed up late had much higher risk of VSD, papillary muscle rupture, congestive heart failure, and death. And there's been a plethora of studies that actually have looked at uh, what's the benefit of doing PCI in these late presenters. And they all show that, for the most part, that you can actually reduce mortality even 12 to 48 hours after the occlusion. So lower mortality, lower mortality, almost cut mortality in half from 12 to 24 hours. Here, 365 patients, 12 to 48 hours, randomized to PCI or conservative therapy. PCI group had smaller infarct size, almost in half, and lower MACE. So this says we need to do something for these late presenters. And, and just to highlight that no studies to date had explored if the addition of SSO2 to PCI in late presenters will improve outcomes. So that's what we wanted to look at here. So this is our first 11 patients that we've done with uh, uh, supersaturated oxygen. These are 11 patients with late anterior STEMIs. Most already had Q waves on their uh, EKG. There were six males, five females, and the average age was 61 years. Their ischemic time was high, 14 plus or minus seven hours. Nine of the 11 had Timmy zero flow, so their artery was still occluded at presentation. Following reperfusion and stenting, uh, uh, nine had Timmy three flow, which is great. Their average ejection fraction was 40. 0.6% when measured by um, echo and MRI just uh, within two days. And the average infarct size 
by uh, cardiac MRI was 28% of the left ventricle. So these are large infarcts. But this was remarkable to me that four of the nine patients that we have follow-up MRIs on or have uh, initial MRIs that had no microvascular obstruction. So we know that uh, these are the people that should really get microvascular obstruction or the ones that have, are such late presenters, but actually four of these had none. So that was very interesting. So all patients remained alive, and just to support how sick these patients were, actually one patient received ECMO and got an LVAD because his heart just didn't, didn't recover. And then so here's, here's what we have, the follow-up data so far. So the EF by ECHO compared to baseline to 76 days increased from 42 to 56 percent by a serial echo at 76 days. So this is a, we didn't see any of this improvement like in our time and late time. You saw like 5 percent. So this, I mean, we're hopeful that maybe this therapy will be good for our late uh, presenters. And Zoll just funded a study that we're going to start between all three of the metro hospitals using this therapy so we can, you know, dive in a little deeper and see. And then following the last question is, what's worse than MVO? Well, intramyocardial hemorrhage is worse than uh, MVO. And this can occur up to 50% of STEMI patients as a consequence of reperfusion injury. And this is really kind of the, um, you get MVO, MVO usually precedes the, the, the hemorrhage. And you, we saw this in, in cloner studies 40 years ago where you can see extravasation of red cells. And that's exactly due to severe microvascular uh, injury leading to loss of microvascular integrity with extravasation of blood. And it's a really bad thing to get blood in your interstitial space because this the breakdown product, products of the blood include iron, which is very toxic to the myocardium that increases inflammation and contributes to uh, infarct uh, expansion. And this is, I thought this was one of the best papers I read last year. This was in Jack, published by Lou. And they this was both a clinical and a preclinical study combined. They, they took 70 STEMI patients, performed MRI analysis, like with T2 star imaging to look at hemorrhage. And they also did troponin uh, kinetics. But then they also did a subset of 25 dogs so they could get pathology. And so this is what they found. If you, have, uh, if you had hemorrhage, you can see a marked difference in your uh, troponin kinetics. So here's cardiac troponin. Both were similar at baseline. You can see how much higher and for how much longer this peak is in your troponin, out to really out to 72 hours where it quickly returns to baseline in 72 hours if you didn't have hemorrhage. And over here, this just shows kind of the plot of how much bigger the troponin values are if you have hemorrhage than you than if you don't. And you can see here that if you had hemorrhage, your myocardial infarction, infarct size was significantly greater than if you didn't. Again, again, uh, supporting the concept that, that hemorrhage is a really uh, bad thing. But this was, uh, this was the most interesting thing to me, that they documented that there is actually a surge in infarct size, that, that these animals all had similar infarct sizes immediately after reperfusion. But if you had hemorrhage, your infarct continued to grow over 72 hours. So this, whereas if you didn't have hemorrhagic MRI, your infarct size really didn't grow. It was pretty constant. So if you look here at the mean MI size normalized to area at risk, it's much, much greater if you had hemorrhage than if you didn't. And this is going on for 72 hours. So this suggests that you have, um, that there's a window there that somehow we could develop some kind of therapy to blunt the effects of, of hemorrhage that you could actually reduce. So this just showed, again, by 24 hours, infarct size dramatically increases in dogs with intramyocardial hemorrhage, but not in dogs without intramyocardial hemorrhage, and that there's a loss of myocardial salvage potential. And this is called the infarct surge. Um, but this is really remains an enigma because these... Not all the dogs got hemorrhage. They broke the dogs down. Why? They all had the same occlusion, yet some of the dogs had hemorrhage and others didn't. So is it you know, breed susceptibility? Is it the time of day when they did the experiment? Was it morning versus afternoon? You know, they don't say. But just the fact that some of the dogs got it and some didn't. So this just, I mean, this just shows, I mean, how kind of I'll just end with how dicey doing this type of research is. So first of all, 
you know, is, is sex have a difference? Is your species, is the time of day that you do these experiments? So you can see how messy this field is. But I think this study was really amazing in, in highlighting, you know, this, this no one would have thought that your infarct size keeps expanding after, you know, 72 hours. So I think, you know, this is important. And I would just conclude that, that MVO and intermyocardial hemorrhage remain the most important remaining targets in STEMI. That even though we've getting these patients earlier to the cath lab and we're opening up their artery and reducing their, their amount of uh, ischemic damage, there's still no therapeutic options to reduce MVO or intermyocardial hemorrhage. And what we need is sort of like a, a Manhattan project for, for these entities. And this was just highlighted in a review by, here's, um, again, um, you know, really famous people in, in myocardial physiology. Here, Ibanez from the Spanish group, Colin Barry, who, we, who was here a few last year, Derek Hosenloy, Gerd Heusch. I mean, these are, these are the, 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 lead, the thought leaders in this area, and they just said that the, we, you know, we, the unmet need to target microvascular obstruction uh, to improve uh, uh, outcomes. So I will stop there. Thanks for your attention. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. I'm so impressed uh, about the relationship between the LV, EDP, and the uh, gradient of the MVO. So I wonder that if I, we can use the impeller during the PCR, so the impeller maybe can reduce the LV, EDP in the procedure. So the, I wonder that the uh, impeller system can uh, reduce the presence of the Right. Uh, yeah, actually, very timely question because there's a study going on now, door to unload, where actually, they sacrifice reperfusion time for putting in an impella for 30 minutes to reduce the left ventricular end diastolic pressure. They think that's actually more important than actually establishing reperfusion. You know, at, from 10,000 feet, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. We're always taught that you got to get in there and open that artery. You know, we all hear about door to balloon time. But, you know, he has data saying that if you unload the ventricle first and then do reperfusion, that your infarct size is actually going to be smaller. So it'll be very interesting to, to see uh, what those effects. I'm just wary about, you know, you're, there's going to be a lot of vascular complications putting in that huge catheter, in, you know, in an artery uh, in the presence of all this anticoagulation. But I, I think from a scientific question, it's very interesting. There's two Davids. Pat, what's... <laughs> yeah, David and Dan, go, go ahead. So, Jay, great talk. So I'm just curious. So we think that edema may be a principal driver of microvascular obstruction, but then we see edema in majority of patients that right. come in with infarct, yet right. about 50% gets MVO. Right. Furthermore, is that we, we have other conditions that we see a lot of edema, non-infarct conditions, Right. we don't see MVO. So I'm just curious what you're thinking is on that. Right, so I, I, I think we think that edema definitely contributes to the MVO, but it's definitely not the, not the whole story, as you said, like half the, the patients. So it would be really interesting if we could, uh, you may be seeing a lot of intracellular edema, and what we're talking about is interstitial edema. So it would be great if there's some way that we could tell the difference between the two, because I think that would be very illuminating that in one, you know, like what we see in myocarditis, maybe that's intracellular edema, whereas maybe in STEMI it's interstitial edema, and maybe one has a much greater effect on MBO than the other. I don't know. I, I think that's, you know, it's a great question, um, uh, but I think that's something that we need to figure out. Jay, I have a question here. Excellent talk as well, and expanding on what uh, Finidek and David had asked. Uh, you mentioned about the left ventricular hypertrophy, right? We don't know is it chicken or the egg because when myocardial is edema, this is going to look thick. But is left ventricular hypertrophy as a baseline, somebody that has hypertension or aortic stenosis or something that drives that, is that a predisposing entity for the development of MVO? I, I would think it is. I don't know of any data because that's out there where, where people have had a priori have had an echo 
I mean, someone really should, we really should be doing this study. We could go back, I mean, you know, we do echoes here like water that, and, and see, and go back and look at baseline, you know, a year ago, did they have LVH? Uh, and then really see if they, if, if, you know, chronic LVH uh, is a marker. I would say it is. I mean, just looking for studies we did in, with Bob Bakke and the dog, where you have, you know, aortic band, the, uh, the dog, and then they develop LVH. They have all sorts of perfusion abnormalities. They have subendocardial um, ischemia. They're susceptible to that just because of both rarefaction of the, the microcirculation as well as much higher end, uh, uh, extravascular compressive forces that inhibit blood flow into the subendocardium. So I think it, it is a contributing uh, factor, and I do believe that if you have, L it's bad to have LVH both acutely or chronically. Yeah. Dr. Harold, would you like to go, go first? Okay, I'll be just quick. Mm -hmm. I know it's a whole different topic, but I was just wondering what your thoughts would be on preconditioning in the setting. So uh, we actually, uh, I'll talk about a form of preconditioning called postconditioning. And uh, I wish, I don't know why these slides, but I can show you here, it's missed up here. But we actually demonstrated in our, we did post-conditioning trial and had an NIH, NIH grant to do that. And we actually showed that in the patients that had MVO, if you had post-conditioning, which modifies reperfusion. So post-conditioning gently restores blood flow. So you do like a series of four 30-second occlusion and reperfusion. So you're gently restoring blood flow. And so what we showed in here was that actually, uh, if you had post-conditioning, actually reduced the amount of MVO that you developed compared to those patients that didn't get post-conditioning. So I do think it, 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 it brings us back full circle to this whole concept of uh, ischemia reperfusion injury, edema, MVO, and that if you can modify reperfusion, that you can reduce the amount of MVO. And indeed, we, we showed that. Unfortunately, the this another slide that got cut off. Um, but, but we had showed in here that we didn't reduce infarct size at all. But if you looked at the patients that had MVO, they actually had, uh, that got post-conditioning, they had less MVO and they had less remodeling. So again, MVO really targets a group. We should, all our studies should be doing is, is patients with MVO because I think those are the people that have the most to benefit are the MVO and the hemorrhage. You know, too many studies do these, you know, small infarcts, they have no MVO, they're going to do fine. I mean, their EF is going to be 55, you know, a month later. But I think we really need to focus on the, the high-risk patients. And I think that's why our stem cell study showed that the people that got stem cells that had MVO, they're the only ones that showed, a, you know, a benefit as well, so. We do have several online questions, uh, the first of which comes from Dr. Hauser, and he is asking, if you could please explain more about the supersaturated oxygen, specifically how it's delivered. Yeah, so there's, uh, we actually put in a catheter in the, in the femoral artery, and we actually extract blood from the, from the uh, artery. It runs into this, basically this machine that, uh, that uh, infuses the blood with oxygen to very high partial pressures on, you know, like 900 millimeters of mercury of oxygen, and then we infuse it back through, through the other, through the sheath, through the sidearm, uh, th or through the catheter that's sitting in the left main. And so then we do that for an hour. After we open up the artery, then we then infuse that SSO2 for an hour down the LAD coronary artery. Interesting. Thank you for that. Uh, sure. The next question is from Dr. Dirks. Uh, he says there seems to be a fair amount of overlap with stroke. Uh, so how about preventing hyponatremia. In preventing stroke? Uh, yeah, and Dr. Dirks, if, if you're still on, online, if you could maybe provide some more context to that, but yeah, that was the question. Yeah, I'm not, um, I can't answer that because I'm not sure the content, I don't, I guess I don't understand the question. Okay, we'll see um, if he, he clarifies. There are two more questions on the Q&A pod. The next one comes from Dr. Sandoval. Uh, he asks, how frequent is MVO in non-atherothrombotic MIs or Minoka, or is, there a pr is this a primary finding of atherothrombotic MI? No, I think you'll see. I mean, we see it in Takasubos, uh, some edema. Um, I don't think we've measured, um, you know, MVO routinely in a lot of patients. Uh, 
I think <clears throat> initially MVO was just found, you know, everyone thought, oh, MVO is due to embolic debris. But yet all these animals have no plaque whatsoever and they get a lot of MVO. Um, and so that's why, and, and, and people have done filter wires for STEMI to try to reduce, you know, they think you open up the artery and then you get the showering of debris. And you do get some showering. You do get, you know, uh, these evil humors that cause vasoconstriction and, and so forth. But the, the studies of like filter wires and things in STEMI has been, uh, has, has failed because we think it's more an outside in phenomena as opposed to an inside obstruction. So, yes, yeah, so MVO will definitely occur without uh, the presence of atherothrombolic, de you know, debris or in the presence of, you know, because all those animals are devoid of atherosclerosis whatsoever and they still get significant MVO. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so Dr. Dirks did provide some more context to his original question. Uh, he said that in trying to decrease uh, stroke size with preventing hyponatremia, and we tried to allow for permissive hypertension, are there similarities for myocardial infarction? Yeah, no, that's a very interesting question. Uh, it just go. I think it goes to show too that when you look at the very first studies of MVO, they were done in the brain, and so the you know, and then the same thing with circadian. That that I mean, the vasculature in the brain and the heart, I think, have a lot of you know similarities. We showed from the circadian standpoint, uh, the no reflow goes on in the brain as well. I don't know if, if um, you know, if there's, if, I know we, you know, allow permissive hypertension, I think, to try to improve perfusion. I, that's my idea. But I don't know um, if we, uh, I'm not aware that we do that uh, following, uh, you know, STEMI. Uh, conversely, I think we try to keep the blood pressure down to reduce myocardial work, which, which wouldn't be in play in, say, in the brain. So... Um, so there's one uh, comment in here from Dr. Lesser who uh, said, we do sometimes see MVO in embolic MI. Uh, so that was just a comment. Mm -hmm. And then the last question in the Q&A pod uh, comes from Dr. Orlandi. Uh, so he says, intravenous nitroglycerin improved hard outcomes in small randomized trials in patients with anterior MI in the era prior to PCI. Given mechanis mechanistic link in reducing wall stress and LVEDP, and compressive forces, do we need another trial of adding NTG to try to lower filling pressure more aggressively? So that's a very interesting question from Professor Olandi. Uh, <laughs> I would say, um, so one of my colleagues from Europe, Stefan Johnson, who's at Leuven, you know, we were talking about this like 10 years ago because I was trying to get his data for his stem cell study too. Um, and he, he was actually had the hypothesis that actually Intracoronary nitroglycerin increases membrane permeability and actually will lead to more MVO. So he was actually, and I never saw if he studied, but he was actually investigating whether giving nitroglycerin would actually worsen MVO because you increase permeability. When we do a lot of gene therapy studies. We actually give, uh, you know, using adenovirus in the heart by intracoronary infusion, we're required to give nitroglycerin ahead of time to basically weaken the membrane integrity of the microvascular to get that, that uh, virus payload into the heart. So uh, it will reduce EDP, and that's a good thing, but it may also increase MVO by increasing the leakage of the microcirculation. So I, I'd be a very interesting uh, study. Uh, that's a great idea. Thanks for your attention. <clears throat>